Shalom, welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dalmar, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of the jbiztechvalley.com and Statewide News. We have a very, very, very special guest with us, Mr. David Soros. He's the District Attorney of Albany County. David, can I call you David? The Absolutely. first thing, you got a nice Jewish name already. <laughs> All right, so it belongs on the Jewish View, David. All right, welcome to the Jewish View, David. Thank so, you for and thanks for coming back. I well, mean, thank this you. is the second time you've been on the Jewish View. This is great. Uh, you're the first district attorney to be on the show, and you're here twice. So it must have been something we did right the first time. Well, you know, I, I think you took it easy on me the last time. I didn't walk out of here with any bruises or bumps, so I'm uh, glad to be back. Well, that's what I say. No one's ever, you know, had a collapse after they've left here. <laughs> <laughs> I've never harmed anyone. <laughs> Um, what have you been up to in the district attorney's office, briefly? Because we can, we only have a sure. half-hour show, and I know. Um, you can. <laughs> well, you know, going into going into the third term now, uh, yeah. after this previous uh, la uh, last year's uh, election, um, you know, you do a lot of assessment. You look at what it is mm -hmm. within your organization that you're doing right, and, yeah. and you take measure of what you're doing right. Continue to emphasize that, and then you look at some of the areas where there's opportunities for improvement. And uh, you know, we, so the first six months of this third term has been a lot of evaluation of our of our uh, processes and and, and enhancing um, th those programs that we believe uh, are working very well, and, and then taking the opportunity to really uh, think about how we what we can do to improve on on other areas. Right. That we so I'll have. give you the first one's the softball question. Sure. What's working well? You know, we have a we have a, a, a DWI policy that, uh, first of all, is one that the entire county endorses. You know, in, in accordance to the information and the feedback that's getting to us, it's one of those areas uh, that I'll tell you um, that if everyone just did a little more, mm -hmm. you could you would save you know hundreds of lives. Um, so a little more in terms of a little more in terms of look, we have so much technology now. We have you know smartphones. We have smartphones right. with applications right. to call cabs. We have the ability to text friends and family. So doing a little more means hey, you know I'm going to go out tonight. I'm going to have a great time, but I'm going to have someone on standby that'll be able to pick me up. Um, it, it, and so if people are exercising, and it's not the police you mean who can pick you up. Exactly, <laughs> you know, and, and that's and you know. That's not always our first option. We'd like right. for people to, to go out and have a great time, but to get home safely. Sure. Uh, but it's one, of, it's one of those areas where uh, you have people that are putting other people's lives in danger. And these people are, mm -hmm. you know, it's one thing if, they're, if people are um, voluntarily entering into this high risk, you know, behavior and conduct, but it's another thing when you're just trying to get home from, you know, a softball game where you have your kids in the car and there's a drunk driver on the road. Mm -hmm. So um, enhancing our policy, uh, being able to work closer with our uh, community of law enforcement and to talk about prescription medication and how that's now impacting sure. on the safety of the roads. And we um, saw that out in Burrysville, I believe. Or was yes. It, yeah. Tragically, uh, you, you know. The woman went up on the curb into a church and killed yeah. a couple of people. Three people who, whose lives and their families, I mean, right. the, just the totality when you are sitting in a room with all of those families and to see the grieving mm -hmm. uh, and the magic that these three people uh, during their time on this earth, the magic that they created and continue to give up until their very it's last moments. Loss. So it, it's, you can only sit in those rooms with people who've engaged or, or suffered that kind of loss so much before you say, you know what, enough is enough and, mm -hmm. and we've got to figure out a way. Of, uh, of, of, of doing a better job of keeping these people off the road. Mm -hmm. So that's an area we've, we're taking a lot of uh, uh, time uh, and engaging in. You know, the area that continues to, uh, to, to, that we've had a lot of great work in is, is the urban violence, is the gun violence, um, but so much more needs to be done there. Yeah, and, and, and when I go down uh, New Scotland Avenue by uh, Madison, I see you, you and the Reverend on the uh, big billboard. And you know, the gun buyback program has yeah. been such an incredible success for us here that we need to continue doing more of that. I've never seen a district attorney so much out front on an issue like than you are with this. And because, that's a compliment. Well, you, I mean, you know, I, 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 you know, I remember, you know, you once went up to Saul Greenberg's office and it was all cramped quarters and you sort of went, thought you were going through a time zone back uh, several decades. Or you know, into like 
in the uh, in the Capitol press room, it looks like we're going back into the front page. Yeah, you, know, you know that scene from the front page of the movie. Uh, but you know, I mean, when I went, I hope that you've updated your uh, quarters. <laughs> well, you, you know, <laughs> you know, the, the but you, the you have a buyback program is something that gets you out there in the yeah. public to interact, and it resonates with the public. Uh, People want to live in a very they want to live a safe existence. I mean, that's we all. No matter who we are and, and where we are from, we all want the very thing that we are entitled to, which mm -hmm. is peace. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there is a perception sometimes, I think, that people who live outside of those communities that are more challenged, I think there is a perception that people want to live that way, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can take the worst streets in, in our communities, and on that street is a family struggling to continue to, to make it day by day. They put their children on the school bus, mm -hmm. they, they, they enroll their student, their kids into you know, positive you know, project, except you know what, the guy that lives across the street is a very bad guy, and it's because of that guy that the entire reputation of that community is being brought down, and it's our obligation to make sure that we uproot that it, person. It's, it's sort of like the strongest uh, the, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. And that's the neighborhood. You know, that's, it's that's only I think as, a as people, good as the weakest yeah. person in the neighborhood. As people, yeah. we need one another. As that's people, true. we need community. I think there are, there are uh, you know, certainly there are all the cultures who at one point or another in their existence that they've suffered, you know, so much persecution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's only through faith and it's our ability to relate to one another, the connection that we make as people, that we forge ahead. And this is the same struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, and the difference is, is that you don't have the same uh, commitment to community. So a lot of what it is that we try to do in these communities, in addition to reacting to violence, is when we try to get out there in these outreach programs, mm -hmm. we try to have events to celebrate youth and to celebrate people right in the heart of those very places where we're seeing the most violence. Because the message that we're trying to send is that, look, yes, there might be bloodshed here, mm. but this is a place where we can still come together and we can still relate to one another as a community. And when you start to build you know, on, on, uh, on, on those connections, mm -hmm. then you'll be able to persevere and pretty soon you know, that element will, will be removed from community. So let, let me go back for a minute about the DWI, mm -hmm. uh, the DWI effort. Are you in favor of lowering, lowering the, the BAC from 0.08 to 0.05? I am in favor of that. Why? Because even though the, the 0.08 is a threshold, that's, that's, the, that's the line of demarcation between legal and illegal. Right. 0.05 is still a lot of alcohol. And there are so many accidents that occur with people who have consumed alcohol and are, you know, they're... Between 0.05 and 0.08? Be between 0.05 and 0.08. So the idea is if you lower the BAC to a 0.05, there's still all of that, um, uh, all of those incidents that you can do something about. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am in favor, I I'm in favor of anything that works to keep people safer. Mm -hmm. you know, there's really a very much Jewish concept that, um, again, instead of this revenge, I mean, the crime and punishment, of course, you have this revenge idea, you know, that people throw them in jail and rid the streets, or, or the Lubavitch Rebbe had a Lubavitch movement, the Jewish movement was always saying, teach people, like you were saying, a little bit faith, give them some self-identity in themselves and they won't commit crimes. Like you said, there's always going to be a few bad apples. The world's not perfect. What are you going to do? You know, you have to deal with it. But there's, I call it the gray area. You know, people aren't maybe so bad, but it's circumstances. You know, so I see it all. I mean, I do go into prisons and see the Jewish prisoners. I see where they're up to. You know, so I might have firsthand, you know, knowledge of the situation. And like you say, the victims, I have to talk to people that have tragedies in their life. But like I say, that really the bad aren't so bad, you know, stigmatized like they're terrible people. So what you're really saying just goes really what I think the Jewish view, that's we're on the Jewish view, <laughs> the Jewish view of, of crime and punishment. You know, yes, there is punishment for the worst bad apples. You know, what can you do with them? 
but they're very few percentage. They're very, very few. And mainly, you know, kids, they need education. They need the social services to, to lift them up. And if you give a person a chance, I think they're going to be a better person. Well, I, always, I always wonder, you know, well, what did we do before we had so many laws and we had so many agencies and we had so many, you know, alphabet soup organizations that are catering to people, what did we do? We lived a happier life. We, well, we, <laughs> we were a stronger community because yes. certainly, yeah. you know, the young man who was, take for example my own personal background. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I have a great mother and I had, I had a great father, but I could not credit just the two of them with, with the way that I was raised. You had neighbors, before you had the internet, my mother could find out if I've done something in a different neighborhood, if I've broken a window or if I've, jumped yes. a fence or ruined someone's rose bushes, she would know before I got home. And it was, it was about people, it was people who knew other people. But by the same token, I was also raised by an entire community. And if you're raised by a community, there's no way you can fail, despite your own efforts to do so. There's no way you can fail. When you go into the, when you go into the uh, prisons and you're talking to a lot of people, for a lot of the individuals who are sitting there right now, this is the first time that someone's actually coming in and asking them a question about how they're doing. And, and yeah. it's amazing to me how very little human contact, you know, and, and how very little some of these folks have in terms of experience in dealing with other people in a family-like setting. It's harder to hurt someone mm -hmm. if you've grown up with that person mm -hmm. and you're mm -hmm. dealing with that person, seeing that person every day. No, I just totally agree. I just want to footnote that it's totally what you're saying. You know, I have, a, I think, a unique perspective, and a lot of even state officials told me because I can talk and, you know, again, a social worker or a prison guard, you know, they're, they're on their guard, and here they're, they're totally open with me. And I've had prisoners, hardcore prisoners, almost crying, if you can imagine that. I don't, you know, I said, you're getting out, I want you to be, you know, I don't want them in prison. Hey, you know, be good and don't come back. And they're almost crying to me that they're going to put me back in the same situation with the same friends in the same neighborhood, and it's just going to be very hard not to fail. So just to break out of that kind of situation, like you're saying, they need a helping hand, and, you know, listen, they have two strikes against them. You know, a lot of times they say, I'm a felon, and no one's going to hire me, and, you know, who wants to be your friend? Oh, yeah, come over to my house, you're a felon. We, we have, we really have to rethink the way that we are dealing with a lot of societal issues. We really have to take a step back and rethink it. Um, you know, you asked me what, what uh, are we doing in the office, what's new? Well, I can tell you that some of the things that we're, we're talking about right now is, you know, you have certain individuals who've made, you know, colossal mistakes mm -hmm. in their youth, let's say 16, 17. And who among us has not made some of those mistakes in our youth? Uh, you know, I, as I always say, but for family and my community, you know, God knows I've tried to do, uh, I've, I've played baseball where I've broken windows. Mm -hmm. we, as kids, you, you do crazy things. We're a less forgiving nation right now. We have so many rules and so many laws that, that really make it illegal to do some of the very things that, as youth, we engaged in. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of trespassing laws now that Quite honestly, like as a child, we went everywhere as a as a group of kids. <laughs> I got to tell you a funny story. I was living on uh, Bradford Street near Allen, and in, I grew up in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, we always played in the street. That's where you know we had playgrounds, but and they were concrete playgrounds, but we always played in the street. So I don't know. I was out there uh, with a frisbee and bouncing it off the side because you can't bounce a frisbee off grass. Yeah. So I'm bouncing the frisbee off, and a cop car came along and said. Son, you can't do that here. I mean, that's what we have parks for. And I said, but I'm not hurting anyone. There's no one around. There's yeah. no cars on the, parked on the street. It's the middle of the day. No, you know, it's, a, it's a side street. It's not a major street. They wouldn't, let, they wouldn't let me. And, and in Brooklyn, they don't care. Yeah. You know? Well, you, you know what? It, it, and, and certainly growing up at the time when we were growing up yeah. is a lot different than, than the way the children are, are growing up right now. But, you know, in terms of ex-offenders who are coming back to community. Yes. There are so many people who have gone out there and really, you know, they, they say you pay your debt to society, and I believe that, you know. You're accused of a crime, if you're proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and you pay your debt, 
there should be the opportunity for you to to reboot, so to speak, your, right. your life and, and, and get on a different trajectory. Because bad things happen to good people all the time yeah. also. Yeah. All right, so let me ask you this. What's not working well in your office that you re need to reconfigure and reshape? And Well, part of it is some of our youth outreach. Um, you know, we have uh, a, a lot of different programs for kids. We have, uh, you know, we partner with Honda Motor Corp. They, they've given us dirt bikes where kids get to ride dirt bikes. Uh, we we have, a, <laughs> <laughs> we have a step team. We have a, you know, we work with the Boys and Girls Club here in the city of Albany. We have a step team and they, you know, they do stepping, which is a f uh, art form. It's a dance and, and uh, you know, the kids, we do outreach through, through that program. We fund, uh, we fund, you know, basketball, we fund lacrosse. We fund a lot of different programs um, for youth. Most recently is a, a escape program mm -hmm. where kids can actually earn uh, a skateboard. They get to build a skateboard on their own if they're reading books and they also read to younger kids. So we, we have, we fund a lot of different programs and I want to scale back. I want to focus on youth development. I want to be able to now go into the fifth grade classes through our Legal Lives program in Albany and work with this population of youth. Because you're, you're talking about a sensitive age where they're still impressionable but they're able to make you know, decisions at this point. Um, so we want to really work with our kids. We want to make attendance in school a mandatory component to be involved mm -hmm. with anything that we do. Um, and all of these, by the way, these things are paid for by drug money. Okay? Uh -huh. All of the criminals that we, that we apprehend, we eventually take It's their, not public funds. Yeah, it's, it's not public funds. It's either private corporations, like you said, Honda, yeah. or it's a... a Monies that money. we seize from drug dealers. And so the, the idea is to take those dollars and put it right back into those communities and try to engage in more youth development. And what I want to do, and, I'm, and I'm, you know, we're going to be following you know, these kids, I want to be in their lives. I want to be in their lives from the fifth grade all the way through... Um, high school graduation because we have to boost the, the, the number of graduates coming out of uh, these communities. We have to do a better job of sending more of these kids to college as opposed to prison. I always say that the, uh, it's a triangle, education and, and child development, it's always a triangle. Parents, peers and professionals. Oh, I, I, and, if the, and if that's not the weakest uh, one of those three is what will break down for the child, will break the child down. You know, if, if the parent isn't there in the life, if they're hanging out with the wrong crowd and their peers, and if the teachers aren't there in their lives in another aspect, you gotta have all three. Otherwise, you're not gonna, the child's not gonna make it. And you're exactly right. And we seem to put so much on our teachers, you know? Well. Uh, we put a lot on our teachers, and in some communities, like for example, I'm, I'm in Bethlehem, and I love, <laughs> I love our school system, um, you, you know, they invite parents to participate and be part of that community. You have so much outside support uh, for the schools. And in our urban centers, what we don't have as much as we have in our suburban communities is that parental involvement. Mm. As a matter of fact, I do a lot of work with the truancy program here in Albany. They are fantastic. Uh, but you have a truancy crisis in the city. And that truancy that's happening at the elementary school level is what's contributing to the lower graduation rates. So where we want to be as an office in terms of our youth development programs, and, we, and we're talking about what we've done right and what needs retooling, we want to be in that little area there dealing with truancy, dealing with youth development, and helping to assist these kids through this process That's because great. we don't want them at arraignment. Mm -hmm. We don't want them uh, right. in, in court. We don't want... The, the saddest day is when you are prosecuting a teenager and that sentence comes down and you know you, you, you reflect on my goodness when I was 17 I was worried about going to the prom <laughs> this child is 17 and the next you know 20 plus years of his life he's going to be I know, in one sad. of the worst you know facilities in the let me ask you one question and I you know we're always discussing in our congregation but when the occupied people were there and they felt that they broke, you know, I don't know if they felt them, everybody said that they broke the law and they weren't prosecuted by your, um, your office. And some people were a little upset by that. Hey, they broke the law, how are they getting off 
scot free. I mean, I don't know if I feel, you know, just we always have issues, I said. You know, that's an interesting idea. So now he'll but, know how to answer his congregants. Yeah, so now I know, they always have the rabbi. You know, <laughs> no, no, I, I, you rabbi, know but, it, that's a very good question. It's a question that I've been asked, uh, you know, uh, an awful lot. I mean, it, in this in this job, you have you have your personal philosophy, and you have your you, you have your own opinions, and then you have the opinions that you should express as the sitting district attorney who's setting policy for public safety. And when you talk about the Occupy movement, and and you know in the context of public safety, you know the day before they came, we had three shootings in the city of Albany. And so as a, as a DA with very limited resources, you know, in the office, we, we're 60 people with over, you know, 7,200 cases mm -hmm. uh, emanating from, you know, just one location. That's a lot. And so I have to make a decision about whether I'm going to tie my resources up into prosecuting nonviolent protesters or as a, as a practitioner, as a strategist, do you you spend those dollars pursuing the most violent of crimes. And that's where we've made our decision. Now, that's my professional, you know, hat. My more personal hat, you know, if you are occupying space that is literally less than 100 yards from where the most important decisions are being made about you and other lives of other New Yorkers, if you're going to be prosecuting those people, then what are we saying about free speech in, in you know, America? And then what are we saying about free speech in the state of New York? So those were two issues that we, we carefully had to balance. Now, um, we usually deal with protesters here because we're in the Capitol. We deal with protesters every year, not just the Occupy movement. This one was a little different because with people who are protesting, let's say, uh, you know, environmentalists, they're going to be here the week that their bill is being discussed and they may stage a protest and so you know that there is a beginning point and you know that there's an ending point for that particular protest and we usually when they're arrested you know those cases come before the court and we adjourn those cases in contemplation of dismissal which means that they don't we don't prosecute them if they agree not to engage if you're good in for six months, months. Yeah. Right. so we, we do that uh, now, with this, this was a little bit different because we knew when the starting point was going to be, but we didn't know what the ending point was going to be. Now, if we had gone and, in fact, prosecuted every one of those people, the, the outcome was going to be our cases, our courts were going to be paralyzed with uh, motion practice, with appearances, with hearings. And what do you say to the people who are being hurt, who are being assaulted? because there are cases that would have been heard in three weeks' time. Now it's going to take, you know, nine months to a year. Well, they have that situation in the Bronx. And they and even brought in judges from Albany and from out of town, other towns, to come in and try to ease the backlog in the Bronx. Exactly. So we didn't want to get into, you didn't want to get into a situation like that. That's something that we foresaw. And, if you, and at the last, uh, I think it was over $50 million that as a country, um, between Oakland in other areas that, that had very um, uh, organized uh, occupied movements, that's the amount that the last figure anyway that was uh, that was totaled for wow. the resources that w that were expended on prosecuting these folks, and um, and there was dialogue, there was constant dialogue going on between my office and and the attorneys representing the occupiers uh, because the agreement was listen, we don't want any damage to property and we don't want anybody being hurt. Mm -hmm. Those are the conditions, and if you can abide by those conditions, then you now, know. There was an incident where some spray went off and it mm -hmm. hit a couple of the protesters or something like that. And I know one of the girl who was hit was Jewish, and she was from Troy. That's all I know. It's the no, Jewish they, angle of the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, uh, uh, I believe her name was Shauna Goldman. Oh, okay. There um, you go. Thank and, you. And I and I know Shauna, but uh, I thought that the uh, I thought that that was not handled properly. In other words, you know, you have to evict the occupiers after several months of them being physically present, uh, and you have your choices. I mean, you could evict them. You know. Um, at six o'clock while the news trucks are there, because that's exactly what happened, or you could evict them at you know, two in the morning, yes. um, when there would be less people no there. Crews. No, no crews. And no news crews, but you would have been able to more efficiently gotten there and, and, and moved people out. 
Um, so I, I don't like seeing events like that, like that whole eviction, because it, it just leaves a stain and in in an ugly image of, of who we are as uh, Albany residents. Um, and, and that happened on one week, and then the following week we had the shooting in the south end of, uh, right. of uh, Nacreem Moore, which, which you know, created further uh, distrust between law enforcement and, uh, and the community. So that was a very painful period of time in, in the history of our city. In the last few minutes that we have, I, gotta, I never knew this, but uh, in 2007, did you consider running for Congress when Mike McNulty stepped down? No, that, that was a, there were people, there was a lot of conversation. It's something but, uh, about Vibe magazine had you quoted in this? I don't, no, I'm asking, no. I don't believe what I read, so I'm going to the source here, just a quick answer. No, that, that to... when, uh, certainly <laughs> when, when uh, the Congressman McNulty decided that he was going to, you know, retire, there had been a lot of discussions about different candidates that could uh, fill that void in, uh, my name was raised and oh, not by you though in, in, the, in that my name was raised and they were talking about it but I have a, I'm a person who takes on a, a project I, right. if I take something on and I have goals that I've set for that sure. I'm going to achieve those goals before I could ever you know move on and um, in the city of Albany Albany County is is the most interesting place sure. To me, there's not a more interesting place. So Congress wasn't really an attraction. For that you. was n not going to be an attraction for me. My my uh, okay. <laughs> my uh, uh, passion is to you know help helping people and changing uh, communities, and and I, I don't believe that Congress can help achieve that. Uh, for, okay. For One other thing that uh, you know, as we look at Major League Baseball mm -hmm. and the Alex Rodriguez A Rod case and. Uh, you started the ball rolling on all this. Yeah, I'm just amazed. Are, are you amazed? I mean, when you see this, I mean, you had a, uh, you you started it. You know, you were down in Florida. You came back here. Other forces took over. Why did you? You know, I think you explained, Mark, for a second for our audience because a lot of people even ask me, how does Albany get in? We don't even have a major league team. Well, that's what I wanted yeah, so uh, the attorney, well, district attorney to. All right. Cool. The, the most amazing thing about. Uh, Albany County, and the, specifically uh, where we're occupied right now, is is that we are the capital of the state of New York, and therefore a lot of your uh, your, your state departments are here. For example, the Department of Motor Vehicles, um, the Department of Health, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Department of Education, and each of these uh, each of these organizations have an investigatory arm. So here in in Albany City is the Bureau of Narcotics Enforcement, which is an attachment to the Department of Health. They monitor, you know, the prescription um, mm -hmm. abuse, and and they are the people that are enforcing the inappropriate use of, uh, you know, painkillers and other medications. Mm -hmm. And so, it was through the Bureau of Narcotics Enforcement, in a collaboration with the District Attorney's Office, that we discovered that uh, uh, steroids and other medications were being sent into our community. And once, you know, you're sending. Uh, products into our community without proper uh, prescriptions, that's a crime and therefore we have jurisdiction over that crime. Now when we investigate a case and we begin to investigate a case, we have no idea where ultimately we're going to end up, but we do follow the breadcrumbs. And if we have the capacity to take something on that is as large as an international or a, a multi-state operation, we will do that. But that's also carefully assessed by us in terms of our resources. And it's also done in collaboration with other agencies. So do you have a sense of, briefly, do you have a sense of pride that you see this continuing all these years after you started it? There's a sense of pride that, that in my office as a, as, a, as a group of people, yeah. that we have the ability to do that. Right. So you learn from that. So there's a sense of pride there. But there's also a, a, a tremendous uh, letdown when you, you know, begin something and you draw something to the attention of Major League Baseball, football, and, and Congress. And there's very little that's being done, you know, since we we began and ended our case. Well, we should have you back much sooner because we're out of time, and there were so many other things I wanted to ask you about. I mean, you're a wonderful interview, and I really appreciate you taking the time and coming in. So. Well, I look forward to coming back. There's some financial crimes cases. There's a, a lot of cases that are impacting our seniors that I'm sure your audience would love to, to and, hear about. And so at the I, Capitol and the prosecutions there. So yep. yeah, I'm sure we'll I'd have love you to come back. back. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you.